Good afternoon, good evening, welcome to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall, welcome to the Shanghai Lectures. <clears throat> so today we're broadcasting from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology uh, in Germany. It's uh, winter here, it's cold, it's fresh, but it's beautiful weather. So today uh, I will be calling on some of the sites uh, uh, that you can see here. <clears throat> and the schedule. I think we have a very exciting program today. So first, you know, we have, we talk about development and then at uh, 10 o'clock we are going to have a lecture by Professor Ning Lan on uh, uh, corticomuscular communication and at 10.30 our, our time, which is uh, I guess about uh, 5.30 p.m. in uh, Shanghai, Professor Roland Siegward from ETH Zurich will talk about uh, uh, navigation, design and navigation. Okay, <clears throat> now, so here is uh, Professor uh, Lan, I will introduce him uh, later, and uh, Professor Siegward, I will also introduce him uh, just uh, before the talk. Okay, now today's topic is ontogenetic development. Before I start, I have uh, two comments. One comment is uh, the embedded exercise. So the deadline is actually Monday. Now I would encourage people, especially from Zurich, you know, they don't seem to be overly enthusiastic about this exercise. I would encourage them to really participate in this. I think it's a lot of fun, as you can see from these pictures. I think uh, you know you can do you can do very nice, uh, create very nice creatures in this way. So please tell uh, Dorit uh, if you uh, would like to uh, participate. Okay. By the way, Dorit, who developed the embedded toolkit, will have her uh, PhD defense right actually this Friday. And it's a public defense, so you're, of course, all uh, welcome to participate in it. <clears throat> okay, so please participate in the Im embedded uh, competition or embedded exercise. And then, about two weeks ago, uh, we talked about collective behavior, you know, cognition from interaction. Collective behavior, extremely important. I don't think we can understand what intelligence is, what cognition is, without understanding interaction. And uh, uh, I came across a beautiful video which shows swarm behavior in the real world, not in the virtual world. So, Nathan, can you play the, the real bird swarm? I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I wonder how many how many birds are in this swarm? Must be hundreds of thousands. So I think absolutely spectacular. That was just, I think it fits with the collective intelligence and I think uh, this is, uh, is absolutely fascinating. Okay, <clears throat> now let me just uh, recapitulate very briefly what we were talking about last week. So we looked at the at human memory, if you remember, and we looked at the passive dynamic walker, among other things. And then we were asking the question of, uh, you know, where the memory for this ability to walk can be found in the passive dynamic walker, right? And of course. There is no specific location like in the brain of the passive dynamic walker because it doesn't have a brain. So uh, where is it? Well, it's distributed throughout the entire organism. Okay, and then we looked at Ashby's concept of memory, which I think is extremely important. And uh, maybe 
we can briefly just switch to uh, Jia Tong University and you can uh, refresh our memories on Ashby's uh, notion of memory. Would someone uh, volunteer there? Hello? Hello? Uh, hello, Mr. Roof. Uh, I think the passive dy uh, dynamic walker has no motor, so it works just uh, because of the uh, interaction with the environment, such as the gravity and its uh, structure. So its memory is embodied. Right, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Right. Do you want to comment on Ashby's notion of memory? You want to briefly oh. comment on Ashby's notion of memory? Oh yeah. Uh, its memory is just in the body. Dynamic worker, I was you know thinking about uh, uh, Ashby's notion here, where he basically argues that if you have a system that is only partially observable, then you invoke the theoretical notion of memory to make the connection between events that have occurred in the past and the current behavior. So I think, and, and in that sense, you know, it's a, it's a relational concept. It has to do with how much I know about the state of the agent. <clears throat> so the extent to which I invoke memory has to do with my knowledge about the agent. I think that's an important notion. And then we looked at this uh, fountain and we were asking where the structure, I mean, we, can, we have a clearly visible structure here of the water, where this structure is actually stored. And maybe we can briefly switch to uh, Korea and you can uh, refresh our memories where the structure is stored. And then I think the second step, which is important, how what this metaphor tells us about human memory. Hello. Uh, a water fountain with pear-shaped appearance is not stored as a structure inside the fountain, but is emergent from the interaction of the shape and direction of the jet, the pressure at which the water is ejected. It looks like a structure, but is continuously created. It, so it isn't stored anywhere. In this case, we can learn to something. The memory is invoked to connect events from the past with the present behavior. Right. Okay, and, and what, what may appear like a structure to us when we look, for example, at a memory experiment, you know, may not be, it may, but may not be stored as a structure in the system itself. You know, so I think this is frame of reference, so I can save the money for the bottle of champagne this time. So we have to be aware that there is a difference between the behavior, what we observe, and what we describe as a structure. But that doesn't imply that it's actually stored as a structure. OK, very good. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's now uh, look at the developmental perspective, developmental approach. Of course, we have the time perspectives. You all remember the time perspectives. So we have, and we basically argued that, uh, I mean, you, you know this uh, diagram here, this cartoon. We argue that the comprehensive explanation of intelligence requires all three uh, components, the here and now, the ontogenetic, and the phylogenetic one. <clears throat> now, interestingly, uh, Alan Turing, you know, of course, we all are very familiar with uh, Alan Turing, you know, computer science, sort of the big, super father of uh, computation and in a, in a fascinating paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence in 1950, he actually suggested something like a developmental approach, what we now call developmental robotics, he suggested for computers. And let's just briefly, I think, go through this. Let me just read off the text here. So instead of trying to produce a program uh, to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. 
presumably the child's brain is something like a notebook as one buys it from a stationer's rather the uh, rather little mechanism and lots of blank sheets you know at the beginning yes our hope is that there is so little mechanism in the child brain that something like it can be easily programmed so the idea you know that this would be simpler uh, to program the amount of work in the education we can assume as a first approximation to be much the same as in the human child so he's really drawing a very clear analogy to uh, human child development and this is now the big field and important research field of what we now call developmental robotics I mean this was more about computers now we know in the embodied perspective that we want to uh, have robots now of course learning is an important ingredient of any developmental uh, system <clears throat> and of any uh, embodied system. Now there is a substantial difference between uh, learning and development, so maybe we can briefly switch to Woods uh, for a short comment on the differences between uh, learning and development. Okay, good, good morning. Uh, we can't hear you very well at this point. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now it's good. Yeah. Now okay. Good. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the speaker is not not now. He will be coming next next uh, next hour. So. Um, no problem. We no we problem. can do it. We can do it. We can do it later. Do it okay. Later. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So now Don can, can be switch back. I th yeah. Okay. So the, the there is a fundamental difference. I mean the. the let's say learning is a constituent of any developmental process a developmental process in addition to being let's say a learning system also has changes in the morphology of the system if you, if you, if you look at babies you know they're, they're about this big you know when they see the, the the world and then they change into these you know really clumsy big uh, uh, things <clears throat> that we are as adults so there is an enormous morphological change the maturation of the organism and the, the the neural system of the organism has to cope with enormous changes during uh, the ontogenetic development so I think this is a, a very interesting perspective to really adopt <clears throat> now to get a bit more in-depth into the developmental processes, let's look at some physical interaction and how the physical interaction with the environment shapes the what we what we call uh, well developmental process or ultimately shapes uh, cognition. So, <clears throat> for example, you know I have a bottle here, right? Now I can grasp the bottle. I will normally grasp it like that. But I could also grasp it like this, right? Which I don't do because I have to. I have to expend more effort. You know, it's like the the muscle tendon system is like a spring system. Now, if I have my arm in this position and I let go, the arm will turn back into this position, the natural position. But not so much because of the control of the brain, but because of the intrinsic, material characteristics of the muscle tendon system. You know, as a damped spring system and of course the morphology has also has to be right I mean it's going to turn back like this not much. like this okay uh, and of course this idea is exploited by the brain so in some sense the brain of course knows about that and it's like this functionality of turning back into this position is outsourced it's as if this functionality were outsourced by the brain to the morphology and material characteristics <clears throat> of the organism. And <clears throat> now what's what's happening also when I grasp the bottle, I not only hold the bottle in the hand, but at the same time I can feel the bottle in my hand. So I'm generating actively through my physical interaction <clears throat> patterns of sensory stimulation in my hand. And we have very rich sensors like on the fingertips we have several hundred pressure 
touch, uh, pressure, uh, vibration, temperature, and pain sensors on one fingertip, several hundred, uh, which is, by the way, a significant challenge then for engineering to have that because we can read it out in parallel. It still functions when we deform it. It's very robust. It's waterproof. And when it's damaged, it regrows. So we have a number of challenges ahead. <clears throat> now, the patterns of sensory stimulation that are generated when I interact with the real world depend on the morphology, you know, on the positioning. <clears throat> so we have much higher density of sensors, touch sensors, in the hand and on the fingertips than on the back. You know, if I want to sort of feel something, I use my hands. I don't rub it against my back because on the back we have a uh, much lower density of sensors. Now, it also depends, the patterns of sensory stimulation also depend on my action. You know, it's like when I do this, I get a completely different sensory stimulation than when I do this. Different action, different sensory stimulation. <clears throat> and when the action is sensory motor coordinated, you know, which grasping of course is, then we get correlation, correlations in the different uh, <clears throat> sensory channels. And these patterns of sensory stimulation that I'm generating in this way are, so to speak, the raw material for the uh, brain to process and to learn something about the environment. <clears throat> okay. Now, I, you know, assume that I'm standing here, and then I sort of let my arm swing back and forth loosely. This is a movement, so I basically control the body posture and then like some random stimulation on the arm. <clears throat> this movement is very easy to control for me. You know, I just basically let the arm hang loosely here. Very little control is required. If you look at the trajectory of the hand, it's actually a very complex trajectory in 3D space. <clears throat> but the control for it is very simple. So why is that? <clears throat> Excuse me. That's because of what we call biomechanical constraints. So we have the anatomy of the body, and we have the muscle tendon system with its material characteristics. And so this is a very natural movement. So even if I have random stimulation, the movement of the hand will be far from random, but will be constrained to this particular movement. <clears throat> so we also talk about exploitation of morphology. Now you can say, well, that's very nice, of course, uh, but you know, what is, it, what is it good for? You can think about it. We'll come back to that in just a second. Now, uh, in, in, uh, so when I want to grasp something, if you look at this, this movement is natural. It's more natural than this movement, right? <clears throat> also, it requires relatively little energy because the muscles don't do very much. And in addition, this movement is more interesting because the probability that an event happens is much higher than if I do this. So if I encounter an object, well, I will grasp it like this because there is an evolutionary predisposition that, you know, the, the hand of my right, well, my right hand is facing left, and then I can grasp the objects like that. Right? It's very easy to do. And then I generate the rich uh, patterns <clears throat> of sensory stimulation. Now, here the arm can be loose, but when I want to grasp it, I need to stiffen the muscles, right, to increase the level of precision. So, also, we talk about compliance. You know, I change, change the compliance, so we have variable uh, compliance systems. Now, there's this notion of compliance uh, that's very important in motor control, also in uh, biomechanics. And maybe we can briefly switch to uh, Moscow for just a very brief uh, explanation of uh, compliance. Okay. Uh, there are several complementary pairs uh, of uh, uh, this concept, compliance uh, versus uh, diversity. Uh, for example, uh, uh, primary and secondary repertoire by Gerald Edelman, uh, accommodation assimilation by Jean Piaget, uh, 
alloplasticity, autoplasticity by Fritz Perls, uh, and the uh, basis uh, um, concepts uh, versus uh, radial concepts by George Lakoff. Uh, and uh, we propose um, uh, the following metaphor to understand uh, what is uh, compliance. Compliance is like uh, elasticity of matter when a system preserves uh, its uh, own core structure uh, despite changing of its form versus uh, diversity. Uh, is uh, like plasticity when a system loses its form and uh, structure and uh, cannot come back to a previous state. Thank you. I think uh, uh, the uh, compliance, you know, diversity compliance, you know, these uh, these trade-offs, and we use metaphorically also the same uh, concept for motor control, and that's why it's important to have uh, systems with uh, variable compliance. And one possibility to have variable compliance systems is to use pneumatic actuators. So pneumatic actuators are kind of these rubber tubes. There is a braided fabric around them, and when you apply pressure there, they contract. And because it's rubbery material, they have this intrinsic elasticity. <clears throat> now, I think muscles, human muscles, or the human muscle tendon system can nicely be described by a variable compliance system. Let's look at the beautiful example of a robot that was developed at the University of Tokyo, the uh, robot frog which is built by pneumatic actuators. And you can see the power of pneumatic actuators. You can actually see the, uh, the, the jumping. Maybe uh, Nathan, can you show the, the video? OK, here we go. Jumping is actually very difficult for robots. <clears throat> and now you can see the slow motion. So watch carefully. The slow motion, it, I mean, it, it looks very, you know, natural. And now you see the damped oscillation. Now, that is not controlled, that movement. That's a result of the intrinsic material, morphological and material properties of the system, of these uh, pneumatic actuators, which have this intrinsic elastic uh, damping characteristic. <clears throat> okay, now this is just to come back to this... Uh, idea you know with the with the swinging arm <clears throat> so we have the morphology and the materials that give me this movement I encounter an object I grasp the object I induce a pattern of sensory stimulation <clears throat> and then what's interesting here is that I'm getting correlations in the different uh, sensory channels and I was actually going to ask uh, someone you know what this uh, why this is a, a good thing uh, to actually have these uh, correlations but maybe that's that's uh, a bit later so we're actually getting the correlations now let me let me see I, I had that ah. okay we'll do it later uh, why is it a good idea to have correlations in the different sensory channels we'll come back to that in just a second but you can think about it in the meantime so we get we can form cross-modal associations, which is very important for learning, and we can extract mutual information. We get back to that in a second. Okay, now we said that we induce information structure, we induce correlations in the different sensory channels. Now, can we quantify this uh, information that's actually induced here? <clears throat> And because we're through our interactions, you know, I grasp this bottle, I'm inducing, I'm generating sensory stimulation in the haptic system, but also the visual system, right? And the proprioceptive system. So proprioceptive sensors are sensors about your own body. I can feel how heavy this is, roughly, right? And so I got three sensory channels, the visual, the haptic, and the proprioceptive. And there is there are correlations. So this is infor, uh, information structure that I can actually measure. And <clears throat> this is uh, that's why this process, because I'm continuously acting, is called information self-structuring. So through our own interaction, we structure the sensory stimulation that we're getting. It's not like a computer that's just sitting there. But we're acting, and while we're acting, and because we're acting physically, 
interacting with the environment. We generate, actively generate, this uh, information structure. <laughs> now, one way to measure that is entropy. I mean, is, is uh, NYU in Abu Dhabi connected? Ah, yeah, here we go. So, one measure is entropy. Maybe you can, you can briefly I'm call sorry, it. I wasn't prepared. Okay. Uh, I wasn't prepared. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, well, maybe the, someone in Zurich can... Uh, Someone in Zurich can uh, venture a uh, statement. Can we have someone from Zurich? You know, entropy. So what is entropy? What is the relation? I think it's very important relation of entropy and uh, information. I think for computer scientists, you know, it's really fundamental, uh, a fundamental concept. Or maybe the, the yeah would someone alternatively alternatively maybe someone here in uh, Karlsruhe or do we have someone who would like to make a statement in uh, in Zurich no okay so maybe here in Karlsruhe I think you know a lot of computer scientists here Okay, well, it seems to be, uh, so entropy typically, I mean, this is a concept that comes from physics, and it's used as a measure of disorder in the system, and we all know that, you know, if we don't do anything, then entropy is going to increase in a system, so that, you know, disorder is increasing, and information is basically conceived as negative entropy, so whenever you remove entropy, you basically create information in a system. So the two are connected and here is, I mean, you don't need to remember the formulas, but if you look uh, at, the, uh, at the one uh, up here, for example, this is basically the classical way of defining entropy, you know, this H, and this is a way in which you can measure information content. So basically just the negative of entropy is uh, uh, information content. And that's what uh, these people used plus other measures like, uh, you know, mutual information. So what is the uh, content, the information content in the visual channel that is also contained in the haptic channel? So, you know, from, from both the visual channel and the haptic channel, you can get geometric information about the environment, very good geometric information. Now, there is an overlap between the two. You know, by looking at it, you already have an expectation of a, what it will feel like when you actually grasp the bottle, right? Now, these expectations are extremely important for motor control because they tell you whether your action was, actually, was successful or not. And this overlap, so there's an overlap in the information contained in the visual channel and the haptic channel, and this is what's called the mutual information here. And that's also defined, you know, via these information theoretic measures. But you don't need to, to really remember that. Now, <clears throat> the, the uh, people did an experiment, uh, Lungarell and Sporns did an experiment, so they basically had two experimental conditions. So they had a camera and they had a red ball. And the red ball was moving around, you know, in a random pattern. And then they had two conditions. One was the camera movement was unrelated to the movement of the ball. And the other one was that the camera was actually following the ball. Right? And then they use this, they apply these information theoretic met, uh, methods. Good morning to Professor Dillman here in uh, Karlsruhe. They use these information theoretic measures to see uh, to sort of to measure the amount of information structure that's actually induced. Now, uh, is Chiba connected? So maybe we can briefly switch to Chiba and you can comment on what you actually see here in these, uh, in these drawings. So which is which condition and why? And can you comment just so we better uh, understand what we see? Yeah, okay, go ahead. I think A is uh, for variation. V is random because uh, this can be seen in the result image. 
Image using foveation contain a higher level of detail in the middle than the ones using random selection methods. Uh, by using foveation, we can concentrate on the more interesting parts of the image and contain more entropy, uh, whereas the less interesting parts remain blurred. Interpretation, so we get an induction of information structure in the center of the visual field in the foveation condition, that is the condition in which the camera actually follows the ball. And when you think about it intuitively, that's of course what, what, uh, should, what should be happening, right? Okay, very good. Yes, indeed, the foveation condition is A and the random condition uh, is B. Now, let me just skip this, this is maybe a bit too much. Okay. Now, the essence of what we have uh, been uh, observing is really the self-structuring of sensory information, of sensory data, through the physical interaction with the environment. And that's one of the fundamental differences between a computer and a biological being, you know, such as a human. And mind you, when I grasp this model, this is a physical process that's not a computational one. So, but it has enormous consequences, implications for the information processing of the brain because it delivers the structured sensory uh, information and I think that's the, that's the prerequisite for learning. So we always have these, we can, we can form these predictions uh, which are very important. Now, some of these ideas, I think the information theoretic ideas are pretty a novel here, whereas the basic idea of having the action that is followed by or the action that generates the sensory stimulation ultimately goes back to this fellow here, John Dewey. And it's a famous paper from 1896, so century before last. So the idea is, you know, more than a hundred years old. And here I just have a quote from John Dewey's paper. Let me just read the, the, the first one by John Dewey. So what he is saying is, we begin not with a sensory stimulus, but with a sensory motor coordination. So, and, and so in a certain sense, it is the movement which is primary, and the sensation which is secondary, the movement of the body, head and eye muscles, determining the quality of what is experienced. In other words, the beginning is with the act of seeing, it is looking, and not a sensation of light. Now, if you think about this, he is really arguing against the sense, think, act model of human intelligence. You know, we always think, well, you know, we have the computer, you know, there's input, there's our senses, and then the brain processes the stuff, you know, makes a model or something, plans for some action, and then executes the action. How else could it be? And he's arguing, I mean, if you read this, it's interesting because you think he's actually arguing against the computer metaphor for uh, human intelligence. And then for those who like a sort of more stilted, more stilted uh, philosophical talk, they can, oops, they can read uh, this uh, 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 quote by uh, Merleau, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who is basically saying, essentially saying the same thing as uh, John Dewey. So these ideas have been around, and it's amazing how little people have taken this into account. So at least uh, we have the Shanghai lectures, and we can make people aware of the fact that the input processing output model, or the sense, think, act model of human intelligence is a very poor model of uh, human intelligence. Now through sensory motor coordinated interaction, uh, uh, yeah, we can induce patterns of sensory stimulation. And the underlying mechanism is one of sensory motor coordination. So again, we have a frame of reference problem. And I think this is really the foundation for learning and development. If you don't understand that, we don't understand anything about learning and development. Okay? <clears throat> so it's this, it's this uh, uh, physical uh, interaction here. Now, there are a couple of interesting principles in development that we have to take into account and that we know from biological systems. Now, remember the principle of ecological balance. <clears throat> Maybe some of you actually do remember. So it 
basically states, among other things, that there is kind of a match in the complexity you know, of the different sensory systems and the motor system. Remember the snail you know, with the large eyes, the human-like eyes, right? I mean, what good are these eyes going to be for the snail, you know, even if it could, even if it had the brain power to detect approaching objects, birds, it couldn't do very much because its movement system is not matched to the uh, you know, sophistication of, of the uh, uh, eye of the, visual, of the visual, of its visual uh, system. Now, it turns out that in development, if you look at development, there is always this balance. Now, one of the, let's say, conundrums of human development is how is it possible that such a high degree of freedom system, you know, on the sensory side, but also on the motor side, can actually learn to control its own movement and its perceptions. Now, what seems to be happening is that initially, even though physically everything is in place, the system doesn't exploit all the possibilities. So the visual resolution is, dim is diminished, is reduced at the beginning, and also the motor precision is just not there. So there is low visual acuity and there is also low motor precision. Now, <clears throat> with that, let's say with that reduced complexity of the system, the, the child can already learn some sensory motor coordination. And when you know, this gets more precise, the maturation of the motor system that makes it more precise also enables the child to make more precise visual distinctions, visual categories. So there is this ecological balance that is always there in the developmental process. Also, the haptic, I mean, this is for people who build robots, like we have, uh, you know, Tamim uh, over there, Tamim Asfour, and we have Rudiger Dillmann sitting over here. They build robots. And, you know, I'd like to remind them that, you know, we have very high-resolution visual systems, typically in robots. Now, in humans, as I mentioned before, we have very high-resolution haptic systems, touch systems. Now, there has to be this balance to get, uh, let's say, meaningful visual haptic coordination. The two sensory modalities have to have you know, comparable levels of complexity. If you just have one touch sensor on each finger, you don't have that ecological balance. And so maybe in terms of learning, you're not exploiting you know, the capacity of the system. I think that's something that we can learn from development, uh, which, is, which could inform the experiments and the, the research that the robotics researchers do. Second point is you know, the exploitation of you know, the principle of cheap design. Remember, that's about exploiting morphological and environmental constraints. If you perform a movement like that, that's exactly what you're doing. And then, you know, the probability that something interesting is happening is increased when you perform this kind of movement as opposed to performing this kind of movement. <clears throat> and then uh, the sensory motor coordination that we looked at. You can use, I'm not going to go into the details, you can use neural networks. That's often used. They're often used for learning, but there are many other ways in which you can do learning. What's important, if you look at the temporal characteristics of a system. When you have a physical system, like the human system, you have certain temporal characteristics. You know, we cannot be arbitrarily fast, but we have our limitations, our sort of intrinsic dynamics. Now, the neural system has to match the physical dynamics of the physical system, obviously, right? So the two have to be in tune, and that's very important. So they have to be integrated. And I think this is a way in which you can actually ground cognition. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Now, there is always, when we look at development, there is always the question, uh, to what extent we can actually explain high, so-called high-level concept, mathematical concepts, you know, abstract, very abstract concepts, like the concept of a number, the concept of transitivity, the concept of a limit. Now, is this something completely different, or is there a relation of these abstract concepts to embodiment? Now, there's something called the Lake of Nunez hypothesis, 
And they wrote this famous book, uh, Where Mathematics Comes From, How the Embodied Mind Brings Mathematics Into Being. That's a constructivist view of mathematics, arguing that mathematical concepts are constructed. And they're constructed in the way they are constructed because of the way our physical system is constructed with our sensory motor abilities. Now, many mathematicians would disagree with this. They are Platonist rather than constructivist. The Platonists argue that mathematical concepts are discovered rather than constructed. You know, the complex numbers, they are discovered, they are not constructed. And so this, that was, there's a big argument. Now here, what's nice about this is that they are trying to uh, argue for an embodied view of mathematics. And if you, I mean, there is, there is a developmental psychologist, Linda Smith, and she said, well, maybe transitivity, the abstract concept, is not so abstract. And she makes experiments with children. And she said, give the children a container and then give them a smaller container. They will put the smaller container into the bigger container. And then you give them a yet smaller container. They will put that into the smaller container, right, the middle one. And then they immediately see that the small container, the smallest one, is also contained in the biggest one, which is an embodied notion of transitivity. So maybe these concepts are more directly related to embodiment than we would think. OK. now. In the, in the field of uh, development, I have to see that I move ahead. Time is uh, flying like an arrow. So often people like to, like here in Karlsruhe, people like to use humanoid-like robots to study development. And I think that's a very interesting idea. So now I see that Australia is uh, <clears throat> today, uh, Tasmania is now connected. So maybe we can have an answer here, you know, which is one of the sort of, let's say, leading laboratories in developmental robotics using humanoids. Maybe you can give us some arguments uh, why this might be a good idea to actually use humanoids for development. <clears throat> <laughs> OK, would someone uh, want to? Uh... Yeah, OK, go ahead. Um, maybe because, first of all, it's intuitive. We are humans, so it's easier for us to understand uh, how to transfer uh, something, our properties, to a robot, as opposed to an octopus. <laughs> OK, and, yes. <laughs> and also, by building humanoid robots, we can maybe understand something about humans as well. Right. Getting, getting something back. Yeah. OK, very good points. Very good points. Yeah. Are there other reasons why we might want to study uh, humanoids, you know, that have a similar physical appearance, and not only appearance, but physical structure as uh, humans? I guess, you know, one of the reasons could also be that all the appliances that we have, all the technology that we have around us, has, huh? all the tools, right? All the tools, exactly. Yeah, maybe Tamim, you can you can argue. Yeah, I, I mean, in uh, uh, the goal, or we are building systems for human environments to to help to be helpers and companions of humans, and all the environments are made for humans. The tools we know and we 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 are working with are made also for humans, and I think uh, humanoids are versatile systems. So we are trying to replicate the best body morphology we know with the highest level of uh, versatility. So they are able to perform a wide range of tasks and they are not only or will be not only specialized to one single task. Okay, very good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, Rüdiger, Professor Dillmann, uh, you know, you know, one of the champions of developmental robotics and also one of the champions, he has always championed the concept of uh, learning by demonstration. Yes, I think important is uh, the aspect of uh, the question, can a machine learn from humans? I think this uh, humans, uh, we have our own development, we can generalize, uh, we are very adaptive and uh, we have a lot of channels for communication and uh, we had enough time. 
several hundred thousand years to develop uh, yeah. machines are very difficult to program if you do everything by keyboard with all possibilities. And I think uh, learning from humans is something to observe, uh, maybe to imitate, maybe to understand, maybe to make uh, experiments and to learn. And my opinion is that uh, machines can learn from uh, humans, maybe also from the Internet. But uh, um, I think the interaction is very important. We learn something on humans themselves, but uh, I think learning from humans is for machines and especially for humanoids. Very good. You can study walking, you can study uh, manipulation, you can study interaction, and you have immediate, uh, you can test does it work or not. Because right. you can, uh, you have um, re resemblance and analogies. And uh, so, how shall I demonstrate a six legged walking machine? Uh, to do right. something. <laughs> right. It's right. much more easy to do it with a human eye robot. Okay. Yeah, very good. So thanks very much for these uh, statements. I think those are uh, very valuable uh, insights here. Now, so uh, maybe I can skip this, but we have to be careful. Remember, remember the uh, quote by uh, David McFarland, you know? Uh, you remember this one? anthropomorphization, the incurable disease. So we have to be careful, especially when we have humanoid robots, that we don't project our own ideas and capabilities into the robots. I think even researchers, even famous researchers, do have a tendency of projecting their own ideas into the, into the robots. Now, especially, this is especially true if you have robots now. You take one like ICOB, which is very which is very famous, and I think everybody knows it. And we just show a short sequence, maybe not on. Can you play the uh, iCub uh, attention video? So if you, yeah, okay. Yeah, here we go. There's the iCub. No, no, this, I think this is in, uh, this is in Italy. This is in Genova. <laughs> Not sure, though, but I think it is in Genova. Okay, right. Right, so, very good. So, Nathan, maybe we can briefly... Uh, Let's say maybe we can briefly switch to Berlin, and uh, you you, uh, you can give us a reaction, a comment on the uh, ICAB attention video. Yeah. Someone would like to make a comment. Uh, okay, yes, go ahead. This, uh, this actually reminded me of uh, a robot I've seen in Japan that was. Uh, so much human like that it was actually unnatural for a person to accept and this sort of caused a similar reaction to me that I can't clearly distinguish is it a robot or is it more human than a robot and it actually feels more repulsive than it should and scary yes hey, yeah thanks very much I think you're alluding to this idea of the uncanny valley right so it, I mean, there are many studies that basically show that humans feel relatively comfortable interacting with robots if it can be clearly seen that it is a robot. You know, even if it looks humanoid, but still, it looks like a robot. When it looks at you, then, you know, some people sort of start feeling a bit uncomfortable. But once they resemble humans too much, then we definitely start feeling uncomfortable. Right? So, yeah, okay. Thanks very much. And looking, you know, just having the eyes, people really get the impression now he, and they, they say he, not it. You know, they say he is looking at me. <clears throat> okay. Now, let me just, uh, for the remaining couple of minutes, let me just uh, briefly introduce a platform that we have been working with, which was uh, developed for also humanoid, for sensory motor, mostly for sensory motor development. 
Now, the point is, and I'm, I made that before, you, of course you can add sensors, right? Pressure sensors, haptic acceleration, vision, and so on, uh, and uh, proprioceptive sensors, angle sensors, you know, force torque sensors, and so on. Now, the point is, and we made that before, that, of course, sensors, yes, but the sensory stimulation you know, with every movement that I make, I induce patterns of sensory stimulation. When I walk, the environment travels across the visual field. So I induce optic flow. We discussed about optic flow, right? And I induce the optic flow because I am physically interacting with the environment. I also induce uh, sensory stimulation in the force sensors, you know, that we have in the body, the pressure sensors that we have on the feet, and so on, right? Or, you know, I can also estimate the angles, the joint angles. So I continuously induce complex patterns of sensory stimulation. And I think that's, that's uh, the thing. And, uh, you know, we already discussed that, but maybe we can have a, a, a short summary from Budapest about why it is so important to have these correlations, this information structure in the different sensory channels. You want to uh, briefly summarize the, the main ideas here? Oh, we can't hear you. Okay. Well, okay. So maybe, huh? Or, no, I think. This is the big class for this um, show. Uh, how to how, uh, how to um, do sensory simulation? <clears throat> I need to speak. Hello, the professor, and I uh, want to know how to you you do the uh, sensory simulation. why it is important to have these correlations in the different sensory channels, this information structure. Before, but maybe you can give us a concise summary of what, what the, the essence is. Uh, these... Uh, you know, we looked at the information structure, how you can measure that, mutual information. I think the mutual information is really important. And what's also important is remember the, uh, the redundancy principle, you know, the design principle. So there is redundancy in the visual system and the haptic system because of this, you know, overlap in the information. And what's important in the redundancy principle is that you have different physical processes, different physical mechanisms. In one case, vision, it's electromagnetic waves. In the other case, it's mechanical touch. Now, if you have redundancy, you take an additional 98 eyes, you have 100 eyes, it gets dark, then none of these 100 eyes are going to do you much good. However, if you have a different physical process, namely mechanical touch, that still functions if you don't have light. It's completely dark. Okay. Right. Now, this platform that I was talking about, this is ECHE, which obviously stands for uh, embodied, uh, embodied Cognition in a Compliantly Engineered Robot, and it's completely tendon-driven. So it's not only mimicking the superficial structure, but it's mimicking the muscles, the tendons, the bones, and the joints. And it's been around the world. Now, not everybody seems to be happy about this. If you look at this guy here, you know... Let's see, if you look at this guy here. <laughs> right. Uh, so, and this is the former president of Switzerland shaking hands with the, with the robot. And maybe, uh, not on, I think given that time has advanced, maybe we just uh, play the second video, you know, where the movement's not the big one. They can, they can watch that uh, later on. Just the second one, you know, well, yeah, this one. So 
Can you maybe switch off the sound? So basically the difficulty here is when we perform a movement like lifting the arm, many muscles need to be coordinated and actuated to a different degree. Now in this robot we have about 50 muscles and they need to be coordinated. So which ones need to be actuated to what extent? That's the big challenge. And that's actually, and th this is basically the successor of this robot that we're currently building. <laughs> it's really, I, I really hate the, uh, the head in this robot. And now, uh, so we had a company redesign the head and then we did a voting on Facebook and uh, you know, which ones, uh, alternatives they like best on this one turned out to be the winner. And now we're designing the head with this one rather than the, the skull-like uh, skull -like appearance. So this is a prototype of the, of the new head. Okay, now we're constructing a torso. I mean, this is just the last video I think that uh, I would like to show. We're con constructing, the, to the torso is actually finished now. Should be, the whole robot should be finished by February, by the end of February next year. Now, uh, not on maybe, oh yeah, here we have the video of the assembly of, uh, of the torso. Everything 3D printing. It's one of the most advanced 3D printing companies in the world. They can actually make an entire arm in one piece, you know, with the joints already in place, and we only need to uh, uh, put in the uh, tendons and, and, the, uh, and the motors. Yeah, and then you can go uh, to Facebook. You you can become friends uh, uh, with uh, Roboy. Uh, there is also we're going to have an exhibition. I think we, with the participation also of uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology here and the Armor Three robot. So that's going to be on the 9th of March. So save the date. Now I think I need to summarize here uh, the development. <clears throat> I will make that very briefly. So we have a system with very many degrees of freedom. How can we control that? It's an old problem which is known as Bernstein's problem after the Russian physiologist Nikolai Bernstein. And for roboticists, there is something like a complexity barrier because if you have all these muscles, they need to be actuated to varying degrees. Which ones? We don't want to program this one this much, this one, this much, and then the movement slightly changes, and then you have to do the whole thing again. So you need a learning and generalization procedure, and let me just, uh, so, uh, uh, you, you, can, you can implement the learning, for example, by neural networks that we uh, discussed. There are some additional aspects of development that I don't have time to go into, and now the assignment for next week would be read chapter five and all the remaining chapters that you, you haven't read. Because next week is going to be the last uh, lecture of this term. So this is the end of uh, today's lecture. Stay tuned for the <coughs> guest lectures. Well, I think that's it for today. So thank you once again, Roland, thank you. for an extremely you. inspiring lecture. And thanks to, to the global virtual audience, so to speak, for the discussion. So thank you again, and uh, maybe Nathan, you can uh, play the trailer. <laughs>